A common meditation instruction is that you should sit with whatever comes up. But the important thing is that you have a good place to sit, a solid place to sit, so that whatever comes up doesn't blow you away. Because some things come up and they're very strong. And you need to be able to resist their strength and have a way of counteracting them, and in some cases when you can, taking them apart. The Buddha talks about getting the mind into concentration as a divine seat. And get the mind into the first jhana, there's a sense of ease and rapture filling the body. And you can work it through the body. Then when you're sitting in that state, you're in a divine seat. So create a divine seat for yourself tonight. Focus on the breath. Notice where you feel it. Remember that mindfulness and concentration are things that you construct. You don't just sit here waiting for them to come on their own. You have to give rise to them. As the Buddha said, you direct your thoughts to the breath, and then you evaluate. On the one hand, you evaluate the breath. How does it feel? What kind of breathing would feel good now? This is an area where you can experiment. He calls the breath bodily fabrication. The word fabrication is sometimes equated with the intention. There is an intentional element in the way you breathe. For most of us, we let it go on automatic pilot. But even when it's on automatic pilot, there's something inside you that directs it now to come in, now to go out. So you want to find where that direction is coming from. An experiment. See what feels good right now. You can try soft breathing, heavy breathing, fast, slow, deep, shallow, long or short. Or simply pose the question to the mind, what would feel really good right now? And see how the body responds. Open it up to all kinds of possibilities. I guess this is one of the duties of meditation, is to expand your imagination as to what's possible. You have potentials here in the body right now, potentials in the mind right now, that if you activate them, can give rise to a sense of intense well-being. Where are those potentials, and how do you activate them? If you can get your imagination seized by this question, attracted by this question, so you become inquisitive, that can fill up the space in the present moment so that random thoughts, old emotions don't come barging in. So take an interest in this. What breathing really would feel good right now? And then when it feels good, how do you let that sense of good feeling spread around the body? And John Lee recommends having it come down the spine, out the legs. But there are other passages where he says, well, think of it coming from the feet and from the hands and coming into the body, like from the soles of the feet coming up the legs, up the spine. That gives you something else to experiment with. When you breathe in, what direction should the breath flow? So that it feels good inside, it feels solid. The body is in harmony. And you find that you're working with three things here. Bodily fabrication, as I said. Verbal fabrication is this directed thought and evaluation. It's the Buddhist term for how you talk to yourself. The comments you make, the questions you ask, the answers you give to those questions. You direct your attention someplace and then you discuss it with yourself. And then there are perceptions and feelings. The perceptions are the mental images you hold in mind, like the image of the breath energy going down the spine or the breath of the image coming up through the soles of the feet or filling the chest. 
bathing the body. Think of the breath as being all around you. We do have this tendency to think of the mind or our ourselves being in one part of the body, looking at the breath in another part of the body in front of us. But the breath flows all around you. Hold that perception in mind. See what it does. So you've got bodily fabrication, what the Buddha calls verbal fabrication, the directed thought and evaluation, and then mental fabrication, perceptions and feelings. Here the feelings are feelings of either pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. You're trying to emphasize the pleasure, the potential for pleasure here. Because here again the Buddha says, feelings can come and go willy-nilly, but you can also induce them by the way you focus on them, by the way you place labels on them. You've probably noticed this yourself. There's a pain that comes in. You don't know where it's coming from. You get upset by it. But if a masseur or masseuse were massaging you, created the same pain, you might actually enjoy it. That's because of the perceptions you have around it. So learn how to perceive the feelings in the body in a positive way. This way you create your safe space, you create your divine seat. So when emotions do come up, and they will, when the mind gets quiet, doesn't have the usual surface disturbances that you generate as you go through the day, which keep a lot of uh, subconscious things down under in the basement. When the surface disturbances are gone, then what's down in the bottom of the lake can come welling up. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. In the beginning it's hard to get a handle on it, so you just hold on to what part of the body you can make comfortable through the way you breathe or the way you focus on it, and just hang out there for a while. But then you have to realize that these emotions coming up, they're made out of those same kinds of fabrications that you're making your concentration out of. And that gives you a handle on them. You can begin to analyze them. When the emotion comes up, how does it change the way you breathe? Can you change it back to something good? And how are you talking to yourself? And what images do you have in your mind? What feelings in the body and feelings in the mind are you focusing on? Can you change the focus? Can you change the inner conversation? Because you notice that a lot of emotions have a storyline to them, and they've been through the mind many times before, and it's always the same story again and again. And it seems designed to get you upset. I noticed when I was first staying with John Fuang, Meditating up on the mountain alone, a lot of issues from childhood, teenage years, college years, came welling up into the mind. At first I was upset. I wanted to get the mind on, on the breath, but this other stuff was coming in to interfere. But then I began to realize that this stuff had to be dealt with. And what I had to do was get a new perspective on it. And as John Fung was helpful, he said, well, look at it in terms of your karma things that happened to you that you felt victimized by. Or maybe you had that kind of karma from the past. And that changes the story. Because you realize these issues go back and back and back, and there's a lot of back and forth, to the point where you have no idea how things began. There's that famous story in the commentaries. One woman chasing another woman around, wanting to kill her child. And so the first woman, the woman with the child, goes running into the monastery where the Buddha is, bows down at his feet. The other woman comes up and is sort of hovering in the background. And the Buddha asks them, do you realize how many children, each, of each other's children, you've killed over the many, many lifetimes you've been through all this? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you have no memory of who began this back and forth. Why continue it? So when you realize that there are things that come welling up, 
that you don't know the whole story, you don't know only part of it. And the question is, do you want to continue it? Why? Part of the mind says, well, I want things to get settled, come to closure. There's no closure in the world aside from entering into nibbana. But you can have some closure when you say, okay, I just don't want to go back and forth on this anymore. And looking at the events, looking at the storyline. We change the storyline like this, it becomes a different story. And it's a different impact on the mind. What you're trying to do is remove all the Velcro. And then you spread lots of goodwill to everybody involved, yourself, the other people. Because as the Buddha said, when you realize you've done something unskillful, the best response is to recognize it as unskillful, make the resolve that you're not going to repeat it. That's going to have a good impact on your karma right there. The fact that you recognize something wrong as wrong, that's right view, and the resolve not to repeat it. That shows a sh change of heart. And then you spread goodwill to everybody involved, yourself, the other people. You spread it to yourself so that you don't keep on harassing yourself with these thoughts. You spread it to the other people involved, and then you spread it to all people you might get in, involved with in the future. And that disentangles a lot of the stories, because they are constructs too. Just because something comes welling up doesn't mean it's any more natural than anything else. It's a construct. What we're trying to do here is learn how to construct better things. The seats that we've been constructing in the past are pretty bad. Here the Buddha is teaching what he calls the divine seat, the mind in right concentration. And when you're well established here, then things don't blow you around. And John Cha, one of the forest masters, has an image. He says it's like you're in a house and there's just one seat in the house, and you're in the seat. And as long as you don't get any, let anybody else lure you out of the seat, you're fine. You're the one in charge. You can tell them to come, come and tell them to go. Everybody else is standing around waiting for your orders. If one of them slips into the seat, then you're in trouble. They're giving the orders then. It's like that famous story in Thailand. There was a man named Si Tanun Chai, who was famous for the tricks he played on other people, including the king. And he'd always get away with it because he was so clever. Well, this one time he was down in the river. And the king comes along with his retinue, and he sees Si Tanon Chai down in the river. He says, I know you're clever, but there's no way you're gonna, you could get me to go down in the river with you. And Si Tanon Chai says, you know, you're right, but if you got down near the river, I could get you out. And the king says, oh yeah? And goes down to the river. And then he says, okay, now get me out. And Si Tanon Chai says, well, I've already got you down in the river. It's whether you get out or not, that's your business. So watch out for your defilements that will lure you out of the seat and take the seat in, in your place. You stay here. Learn how to construct a good seat so it's a good place to stay. The breath is comfortable, it fills the body with a sense of ease and harmony. And as you're busy constructing this good seat, you find that you don't have much time for these other things. And when they do barge in, you can take them apart. If you can't figure out how to take them apart quite yet, well, just hold on to your seat. And that way you can stay safe. 